live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetRootsRadio.com presents David Walker, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. Time for another show and time to look around in amazement at what is happening <laughs> to our country and to our world. Hooray! Time to clean up the mess made this morning by Donald Trump and, of course, uh, get to all the mess made last night that we still haven't had a chance to clean up just yet. It's a wild and wacky Wednesday ahead Pretty much as predicted. We are without Joan McCarter today, who is holding down the fort over at Daily Coast on the front page today as uh, the rest of the Daily Coast crew get together for a big discussion about, uh, well, what the hell to do going forward with the the world in a state of disarray and how to cover it for you and how to bring it all to you best. In the meantime, we'll bring it to you worst here on <laughs> Daily Coast Radio. Why not? Uh, that's what we, well, that's what we do regardless. So there's no stopping us. Don't think there's any way to change direction on us now, of course, unless of course you'd like to give it a try anyway. And I encourage you to do so. Never give up ladies and gentlemen. And you can always tweet us here at, uh, use the K I T M K grow in the morning hashtag on Twitter, a quick and easy and uh, relatively reliable way of getting a message to us during the show, but uh, we're busy doing a live radio show, and sometimes we forget to look around, and so don't be too insulted if we happen to miss your comment. We like to include you in the show, and of course, if you definitely like to be included in the show, don't forget, as we remind you each day in our fake advertisements that are inserted into the podcast version of the show, you can always sit right down and hear a tale, tell a tale, I guess, of whether it's a tale of a fateful trip or some other kind of tale, just start up the old smartphone or any other electronic recording device. Read a story you read in the newspaper that you think is interesting and we haven't covered yet. Make up a story. What the hell? We don't care whether it's true or not. <laughs> Tell your own story. Read us a blog post that you're thinking of posting or have already posted. Send it to us at kgrox at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, keep it to a man manageable length and don't mow the lawn while you're doing it or something like that. And keep, uh, you know, if it's of reasonably good quality, we can share it with everybody here on the show. <clears throat> that reminds me, I have got, and I, I should thank the folks who sent this to me, and I'll have to maybe take a moment during one of the breaks to make sure I get the names right. They sent me actually an excerpt of their own podcast, which I guess that's eligible Two, as long as it's a manageable length. The, the problem was a very interesting topic, but they were very lengthy pieces because they come from someone else's podcast and they have an extensive amount to say about this very interesting topic. Uh, so that is a little bit more difficult to include, like up to the line where I might say I cannot figure out exactly how to work that into the program unless I get laryngitis one day, which is always a possibility. But... Whether you've produced it professionally as a podcast or not does not matter. All we need is your voice, your identification, how you want to be identified on the air. And if there's some published material that you're reading from or something that you have published about it, please include a link and we'll put it in the roundup. And we'll, we would be pleased to have you as part of the show. And that way you don't have to worry about whether I see your message or not. Anyway, Daily Coast Radio is live now. We have been for some five minutes or so. And guess today's secret mystery phrase in Kegro X, that's me, David Waldman, will have a Russian oligarch deposit $500,000 in your slush fund. It's a promotion we're running here. We're not running it here. No one's running it anywhere unless you're on the Trump team and on the take. Bill in Portland, Maine reminds us, though, <clears throat> of one of the top stories of the day with that kickoff tweet. Yeah, I, you can't avoid it. Greg Dworkin should be here, and I... I feel certain that he's got this among the stories that he has rounded up for today. There's really nothing else that competes because, of course, it lays bare pretty much the same, you know, the very system of corruption that you figured we were going to be uh, discovering along the way. Ah, here comes Greg now. 
We'll answer the phone. Good morning, Greg. How you doing? Hey, how are you? Uh, I'm not as rich as Michael Cohen had hoped to be, uh, but I'm okay. How are you? Uh, so Michael Avenetti has some great uh, tweets this morning. So the background yes. here is it turns out that he was exposing and now corroboration uh, from well, various media outlets oh, Okay, that uh, there is a, a slush fund. Yes, there is. There are probably many. That LLC was running. Yeah. And a bunch of... Uh, Corporations Dummies. were throwing corporations. money into it. Yes, uh, a lot of people were throwing money into it. But yeah, corporations would be the ones that worry us the most. Right. So Avenetti uh, tweets really, this morning, actually, priceless. Yeah. Wat watching all the companies that send money to the LLC slush fund come up with different alleged reasons for hiring Mr. Cohen. <laughs> uh, accounting advice, real estate yeah, consulting, yeah. insight. Who knew Mr. Cohen was such a brilliant renaissance man? Sean Hannity knew. Yeah. And now Novartis claims they hired Mr. Cohen for health care matters. They paid him approximately a million dollars. Wow, he's wow. a doctor as well. Very talented guy, this Mr. Cohen. Yeah. It is so. pretty amazing. People were wondering last night about, well, you know, in, uh, for instance, in the, in the case of AT&T, which paid something in the neighborhood of $200,000 to him, uh, people wonder, you know, with so much money at stake for AT&T, they had a merger in the works before the uh, antitrust division. And I guess they thought that was like penny ante money for the amount of of dollars that they hoped to make. And uh, yeah, well, eventually we'll probably find out. This was all probably just to get a Michael Cohen to make a copy of the bribe menu for you. This isn't necessarily the bribe money. It's just playing around money that his dirty lawyer wanted to have and uh, that the boss man said you ought to give him in order to to stay in play. Very so here's here's uh, NBC's version. Stormy okay. Daniels' attorney claimed Tuesday that President Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, received $500,000 from a company controlled by a Russian oligarch. Yes, that's a problem. Deposited into an account for a company also used to pay off the adult film actress. And that's the other problem. Well, thereby uh, connecting the Russia uh, collusion issue with uh, Stormy Daniels. Uh, yeah, that is like, a, where did, where did, uh, Cohen get the money to yeah. pay Stormy Daniels and the 1.6 million to his other client who may or may not have been Donald Trump. Right. Uh, but was supposed to be Elliot Brioti who got a playboy model <laughs> pregnant and had to deal with that. Where did the money come from? What if uh, it came from Russia? Yes, that is also a good question. Uh, I don't know if it's now once it's a payoff for something like that, I don't know if, I, well, it doesn't matter that much whether it came from Russia in the sense of like, well, now you're talking about corruption. But, but yeah, it, it only makes things worse, obviously. I said that, but, oh, the but corporations why would, but are But why would Russia about. say, okay, I'll pay you money? What I, do they get out of it? Right. Well, no That's one knows. That's where the collusion part comes in. Yes. Uh, I had said earlier, oh, yeah, well, we're really worried about these corporations. But far worse than the corporations is people that – if you can't figure out the corruption right away with Donald Trump and Michael Cohen – that's actually like with other people, you say, hmm, maybe it's not corruption. With these guys, you say, oh, my God, this must be so much worse than I first believed. I can't even imagine the angle on this one. What are they getting? Because yeah. they're getting something. Uh, gee, I wonder. I mean, there's been no speculation about that. No. Daniel's attorney, Michael Avenetti, also detailed other transactions he said were suspicious, including deposits from drug giant Novartis, the state-run Korea Aerospace Industries, and AT&T which confirmed it paid Cohen's company for insights into the Trump administration. Yes. If true, Avenetti's claims made in a dossier posted to Twitter, because it's important to make it a dossier. Yes, that's how you know it's real. Yeah, could add a new dimension to the federal investigation into Cohen. NBC News has reviewed financial documents that appear to support Avenetti's account of the transactions. So uh, what do I take from this? Michael Cohen really right. is in trouble. Yes. And there was a reason why the uh, Southern District of New York raided his office and home and other places of uh, employment yes. as if it were a, uh, a mob style uh, money laundering operation, because guess what? It is. It is. Yeah. Well, that He's puts terrible. him in jeopardy and makes the idea that they have a lot against him and therefore indictments may follow and therefore he may flip. That makes that whole story a whole lot more reasonable in context it does 
And it makes so many stories more reasonable in context. You mentioned the Elliot Broidy story. That story, I, I was very annoyed. It was sitting on my screen yesterday, and I spent time on everything else figuring, okay, well, we can deal with this tomorrow. And we, we had at some point, I feel like we made mention on the air of somebody else's theory mm-hmm. that it wasn't Broidy, but it was Trump. But right. uh, we, that somebody kind of wrote a story some, about that. Yeah, so, now okay. it's now it's all written up. I think we might have read a tweet somewhere a couple of days ago. Uh, but I guess that thought was brewing in a lot of heads. Good thinking, mm. guys. David Korn has a tweet that says, Michael Avenetti's bombshell report raises this key question. Did a wealthy Russian with Kremlin contacts yes. funnel money to Trump and the Republicans? Yes. And then you sort of like make your own conclusion there. No. And yes. TPM, Josh Marshall writes, Tonight we have what I'd say may be the most staggering revelation since the tangle of Trump-Russia began almost two years ago. This is not hyperbole. Mm. Late this afternoon, Stormy Daniels' journey, Michael Avenetti, And by the way, Michael Avenetti is doing a bang up job. Oh, he is. Yes. Michael Avenetti posted what he called the preliminary report on financial transactions of Michael Cohen. The claims were staggering, but this wasn't a legal filing where the attorney in question needed to vouch for their accuracy. For all the fancy language, it was a press release with no clear explanation of the basis for the various claims. It's an example of how TPM in many ways is a much more conservative operation than many mainstream media publications. Bloomberg published basically all the claims, even though it was clear it could not independently verify them. To be clear, this isn't a criticism. These are fact cases for which this is a little obvious precedent. In any case, the key claims are now being confirmed, in most cases to the letter. In other words... Just through this single shell company, Cohen was receiving major payments from a Russian oligarch, additional monies from various Fortune 500 companies, looking for access to President Trump. Ah. On the U.S. corporate side, their classic off-the-books pay-for-play payments to what appears to have been a slush fund. If you spend any time covering political scandals, you can't look even at these initial details and not think this is the kind of story that sends a bunch of people to prison. Yeah. It's, That's a pretty good summary. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, it's, it is a really amazing thing. And, uh, the the thing that stuns me about it most really is how bad of a lawyer Michael Cohen really is, which which only makes all these payments to him that much more ridiculous. But the fact that he made this mistake with, I mean, that he got the sense that he should be dealing with an LLC. He forms the, the limited liability corporation, uh, essential consultants, which is what he uses to pay off Stormy Daniels and God knows who else. And then when slush fund money starts becoming available, he's too lazy to start another LLC. Now, again, yes, just like all his NDCs right. have the same uh, Daniel Dennison stuff, right? Yes, right. And I, w- w- except that turns out it's because it's the same person. But it, it's think, a different Peggy know, Peterson. It's the Elliot Brody piece. Yeah. It is. But Peggy Peterson is different. So maybe. But uh, he's too lazy to start another one. And again, it's in the name, Limited Liability Corporation. What would you want to use one of these corporations for? To do what with your liability? To limit your liability. And as I said yesterday, just hearing about this, Donald Trump's lawyer, that's a mistake. Michael Cohen is Donald Trump's lawyer is false. Donald Trump's real lawyer is Alan Garten, and he's the executive vice president and chief legal officer or whatever, a general counsel of the Trump organization. And we've been over this with LLCs before. Donald Trump has hundreds, possibly thousands of LLCs. And it's, you know, it's normal also practice. Known as shell companies. Yes. Now, it's a normal practice in real estate and in other areas. And and the idea is, I mean, he'll have an LLC form for the discrete purpose and not, not the surreptitious discrete, but the singular discrete purpose of the ownership of a single condo unit somewhere and it's all done building or whatever each there's one for each one so that if it goes belly up he's not responsible exactly and it separates the business ventures i'm not a lawyer i just don't understand this at the internet level well i mean how much more do you have to understand it's called limited liability (laughs) that's the reason so but but cohen is like well i'll start a limited liability corporation to pay off stormy daniels and then i guess i'll pay off some other women possibly but then money starts coming in for totally different purposes and he's like why do paperwork I'll mix the money that I'm getting for access to Donald Trump or access to the way he thinks or whatever you want to term it and the porn star money. I'll just put it all in the same pot. Who's going to know the difference? And I mean, 
That's like the most basic function of a Donald Trump lawyer there could be is separate everything so that I can't be held liable. He created well, liability but, in himself and the president of the United States because he was too lazy to fill out another form. But there's two purposes for these shell companies. Oh, OK. Yes. All right. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, mean one uh, one is to separate. Yes. The other is to hide. Yeah. But. What do they tell you to do with eggs if you have more than one basket? Have somebody else carry them? Yeah, well, that would be a good idea for him. Don't let this guy touch the eggs. That way I'm limited eggs. liability in case you drop say. them on the kitchen floor. It's not yeah. my shoe. Uh, th th this guy is like, what I should do is I should lump all my liability into one limited liability basket where all my eggs go. That's a great – I think that's what people say. Put all your eggs in one basket, then kick the basket and also steal other people's eggs. Well, but that's the thing. If your purpose and function of setting this up per yeah. condo is to isolate yourself right. and separate yourself from the liability, that's one thing. Right. But if your major function of doing this is actually just to hide where the money's coming from, okay. then why do you need more than one? Uh, if you don't find hide. out about this one, who cares? I, I'm just surprised he didn't name <laughs> it the way if you that he named his taxi companies. Right. Why didn't he just call yes. it the fixesin.com? Uh, I don't know, but he had eight. He has different LLCs for different medallions. Even he knows this. Well, he's a lot more careful with his own stuff. I guess that's possible. He's looking to be caught. Uh, the other side of the coin, though, is that you know he yeah, probably yeah. developed all these other LLCs for his taxi companies over time, whereas this was okay. I got Trump, and then we got this election. Let's just do it all in one place. Yeah. I guess, or, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking it in cash and putting it under your mattress. I mean, that's even smarter than putting it in the same. All right. right. Well, he's it very seems bad. to me, he's very seems bad to Josh dumb. Marshall and others, the fact that there's this fellow named Vexelberg. He's a yes. Russian oligarch, very close ties to the Kremlin. And Marshall says the big revelation is Vexelberg's money. Remember, we heard recently that he was one of the one of, uh, who Mueller's investigators stopped in question when he transited through U.S. airport. Yes. So this is money more or less directly from a top Russian oligarch with close ties to Putin, putting money directly into a shell company controlled by Donald Trump's bag man and fixer. So collusion, real high level, whereas the American corporations is basically garden variety corruption. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty gardeny. But, you know, it's the money trail. And that's his point. Yes. So does any of this matter? Eh, no. Well, it's it's interesting. Yes. Uh, eventually it will. I changed my but, mind. But uh, for now, uh, not clear why. There's this fascinating article here I'm going to give you. Okay. I like fascinating uh, Which ones. is from the Washington Post today. And it's uh, on, uh, sometimes they make up these new vertical columns that they didn't have before. This one is made by history. Hmm. Okay. Because he's a historian. Oh. Thomas Glassbergen is a PhD candidate in history at McGill in Montreal. And his research examines John Wilkes. Oh. John no. Wilkes, not John Wilkes Booth, but John Wilkes, a British rogue who became uh -huh. Lord Mayor of London. Well. Right? He's like that fellow in Toronto that became mayor. You know, <laughs> with, uh, yes. They should have called him Lord Mayor. He well, might have asked people to do that. You know, why Trump seems impervious to scandal for now is that. Lessons from an 18th century English road. Ah, here we go. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Hey, Stormy. I President see. Trump seems uniquely impervious to scandal. While he maintains generally low approval ratings, oh. scandals such as the infamous Access Hollywood tape and locker room talk, or even the persistent allegations concerning an affair with porn actress Stormy Daniels, have done little to diminish the robust support that Trump enjoys from his base. White evangelical Christians who are purportedly concerned about morals. A recent poll found that 75% of them approved of the president. And it's important to remember that when we're talking about Trump's base, we're talking about rally voters, we're talking about people who are with him. Yeah, these are white evangelical Christians, right? So this yes. is the old moral majority who actually got into power. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, all right. Right. I mean, just, you know, it's, uh, when you start thinking about these, well, you know, just these fellows at these uh, McDonald's in West Virginia, this, that, and this is white evangelical Christians. But Trump is not the first populist to shrug off bad press. In 18th century London, there was another politician who, despite his openly scandalous personal life, achieved thunderous political success. John Wilkes was a well-known libertine and an outlaw convicted of seditious libel against the king. And he was oh. tremendously popular. Tremendous. 
In the 1760s and 1770s, London regularly resounded with shouts of Wilkes and Liberty. Huh. That was his Make America Great Again thing, right? Yes. And then uh, he also, I guess because uh, some satiric broadside had brought his uh, existence into public uh, 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 consciousness, and it was issue 45, the number 45 was associated with him as well. Really? How For Wilkes, this meant seizing the alternative structure of politics that emerged in 1760s London. The political press was expanding rapidly in sheer volume as well as variety. And Wilkes took full advantage of this, recreating himself as a martyr for English liberty. He might suffer exile and imprisonment, but it was for the sake of the liberties of all Englishmen, especially Thanks. his followers, the Wilkites. In place of MAGA, Wilkites had Wilkes and Liberty, which they never tired of proclaiming in coffee houses instead of red caps. They spread the oh so familiar number 45 because issue number 45 of satirical political paper called The North Britain brought Wilkes into conflict with the government to begin with. Hmm. You can get stuff emblazoned with 45 in it and wear it. And even the stickiest dirt refused to cling to such a political icon. Wilkes, who was a serial philanderer, was separated from his wife, which was a more serious scandal in that time than ours. But all his support is needed was something to latch on to to excuse the misdeeds. He had a good relationship with his daughter, Polly. Therefore, he was a good guy. <laughs> sure. This, that, everything else. As for charges of unsavory behavior, physical mockery failed to dent Wilkes' support. He squinted a lot. And so the squint <laughs> became a, a thing that his uh, supporters would do. I know a guy who's like this. Right? Yeah. Orange, you know, hair, tie. We mix with this all the time. There's just so many his, parallels here. You've seen his uh, his monogrammed cuffs, uh, huh. Trump. His, he, you know, he he has 45 like uh, embroidered on the cuffs of his, his shirts yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's such a great parallel. It's In 1774, fantastic. Wilkes achieved his major political goals. He was elected Lord Mayor of London, a member of Parliament, and having attained this, he then faded away. Oh, Wilkes' cut, cult of personality no, could not survive achieving respectability. And Wilkes made no great effort to keep it alive. Huh. So uh, like Wilkes, Trump has portrayed himself as a martyr. His followers believe he suffers the barbs of fake news because he's willing to stand against PC culture. In their eyes, he's the only one courageous enough to make this stand and thus the only one able to fix Washington and restore the values that generated American greatness. Consequently, Trumpites view Trump less as the leader of a coherent political movement with oh, clear goals – and more as a champion against the forces of corruption and tyranny. Whereas that is bad. I mean, I know it's dumb. Yes. But then people who believe this are dumb. Well, yeah. And there's a lot of them, and they vote, and so they have power. Yes. Right? Well, That's why you can't shame a Trumpite. Mm. I love that line. You cannot shame a Trumpite. The more critics heap insults upon them, the more certain they are that their cause is just. Okay, By supporting Trump mind. and receiving abuse as a consequence, they feel they're participating vicariously in Trump's heroic stand against the hated establishment. You know, a fancy way of saying that, you know, it triggers the libs. Yes. I'm surprised, though. He does spends the rest of this or a lot of the rest of this article reminding everybody that all those things that I said earlier that Wilkes did that you knew that Trump did. Trump does those things, but the 45 monogram doesn't get in here. Hmm. And I think now, a for Wilkes Park's company with Trump is hmm. in one critical respect. Oh. Wilkes morphed into a conventional politician after getting elected. Trump has by and large refused to do that. Ah. He delights in flouting both presidential convention and party lines. Yes. Trump shuffles through staff ah. so frequently because it helps maintain his image. As long as he continues in this way, his personal political brand maintains its appeal. And Trump remains relentlessly focused on his political celebrity, believing it's just as crucial for exercising power as it was in gaining. And he's right about that. He certainly got that insight. That's why he focuses on his base. The thing that I don't understand is why the media focuses on his base, because it's like yeah. there's the other 60 percent of the country. Clown show. Despite this difference, the comparison with Wilkes does suggest one thing. To maintain his support, Trump will have to continue to protect the image of a political martyr. This means he can't afford to function as a normal Republican and cooperate with Republicans in Congress. Don't worry. If he gets his way and rules effectively, he'll be normalized, loses appeal. Respectability is Trump's kryptonite. Unfortunately, maintaining his image as political martyr will require the regular introduction of threats to Trumpism, real or imagined. Domestically, this makes for a bleak and polarized landscape. Internationally, there's the real possibility that Trump's enthusiasm for trade wars might spill over into a deadlier manifestation of belligerence 
Now we got this Iran thing that happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, Trumpites were promised conflict, and conflict is exactly what they're going to get. So it's a rather grim view, but at least an explainer in terms of how come Trump keeps his support when he's doing all these bad things, yeah. because he was elected to uh, fight with everybody. True, and a, and a much bigger a Twitter bigger troll, troll yeah. who was elected president, yes. and the only way he can maintain power is to maintain his reputation as a Twitter troll. Well, he's and every time people it. say, "Well, why don't you do this differently?" He's going to say, "Well, that's not why I'm here." Right. I know why I'm here. I got elected to be a Twitter troll. I know better than you. He's right about that. And so he refuses a normalization. Oh, we're getting to a war in the Middle East. What could go wrong? You know, that's not my problem. The point is I'm being seen as bold and doing things that my predecessors wouldn't do. Well, there's a reason why they wouldn't do it. It's like really bad idea and stupid. Yeah, but that's not the point. Yeah. The point is that I'm disruptive. Right. Well, there's a there's a precedent for that. And we've, we've paved the way for that. And uh, we've put a high value on the idea. I mean, unfortunately, spent the last decade or more saying, yes, disruption is like a real business buzzword and we wanted a businessman. And so he's just kind of able to latch on to that. It's amazing. It's a great piece and, and a good reminder of what's out there in history. Um, is Did John Wilkes eventually die? Uh, everybody does. All I mean, right. I was just in checking. the 1780s. I would think he did. Good. Uh, just checking. And, uh, you know, if everything kind of runs in parallel, we can expect the same from, from Donald Trump. Eventually, Eventually his yeah, time yeah. will come. He's not death proof. That Well, for after the break, which is coming up, we got another one. This one from Charlie Sykes from the Weekly Standard entitled, When Everything is Possible and Nothing is True. Mm. Uh-oh. Yeah. So, uh, this is the official LOL YOLO Nothing Matters analysis well it's more uh, about the it's old, an analysis uh, of that carl rove line about we make our own reality okay and propaganda and it's dangerous okay which is i think a fancy way of saying uh, lol hello nothing matters but uh, you know but in a way that makes you think that uh, maybe you can control your own destiny after all by lying to everybody else we'll be back uh, in two minutes silly person yes Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGROX or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We were just checking over the break. Thanks, Greg, for sending this along. I guess John Wilkes Booth, the famous one, uh, infamous one, uh, was named after, intentionally named after John Wilkes. And you looked it up for us, and I guess, is this Wikipedia on him or something else? Oh, the Latin. Something called the Latin Library. Oh, oh the Latin Library. <laughs> My so, favorite library. Yes. Um, well, it, it sounds authoritative, and therefore it must be true. Sure. Booth, born on a farm in Bel Air, Maryland. I know where that is. Uh, his parents, this is this is some intentionally named family members. Uh, Junius Brutus Booth <laughs> and Marianne Holmes, somewhat less intentionally named, were British and had moved to the United States in 1821. He was named after the famous British revolutionary John Wilkes, whom the family claimed as a distant relative, which is interesting all by itself. And, uh, well, they're... It's interesting, too, that they immigrated to the United States and uh, they brought up their son to assassinate the president. And uh, they're British immigrants. They probably would have cleared customs under the current administration, but uh, they were uh, criminal aliens nonetheless, I assume, because well, well, you, that's, couldn't be, that's... you couldn't be legal then. You just sort of walked in. And then I guess if you raise your son to assassinate the president, even many people don't know this, but he was a Republican, mm. uh, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I mean, I guess that you, he, you, I guess we could think, well, he was trying to nip this whole thing in the bud. But 
Well, I don't know. Uh, still according not the right to this piece I'm reading here, Junius himself. himself was named after the legendary Roman statesman Marcus Junius Brutus, one of the yes. assassins of Julius Caesar. Yes. <laughs> so assassination just like was in the family here. Right. I mean, that's basically what you're you're getting at. So somewhere, you know, Lee Harvey Booth is uh, running around getting ready for his big moment on stage. You meant, you meant John Wilkes Oswald, right? Yes. <laughs> or Marcus Junius Oswald. You know. <laughs> Really? See, Man. this is why people sometimes use their initials, right? JB. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's true. JB, what's that for? Hey, JB. Uh, right. Know. It's a lot easier to get along with, but uh, there are still people who who do those things. And uh, by the way, yeah, putting Lee in your name anywhere, uh, really, run you run the risk of, uh, uh, a, what, matriculating into, we'll say, the... Uh, the the criminal justice system. There's something my my brother once observed about the number of people on death row who had Lee as a first or second name. Well, now, Wayne is another biggie. Well, yeah, I know, but you know, it's, I'm just thinking of the musical 1776. There's a whole song about the Lees. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. Uh, so hey, there's some good Lees, some yeah, good Waynes. Lees Virginia, Bruce Wayne that, uh, was a terrific guy, a bit of a vigilante, but uh, and an oligarch. All right, no, never mind. Knows. There are no heroes. So uh, <laughs> this is a piece by Charles J. Up. Sykes, Charlie Sykes, uh, that appeared in uh, the Weekly Standard. A very interesting piece to follow up on this the uh, about Trump. And uh, it'll it'll uh, remind you of a fellow named uh, Karl Rove in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, it's It's about reality. And Sorry, I think Rove. it was uh, Karl Rove off the record who talked about ah. uh, the reality-based community. Ah, yes. A source familiar with Karl Rove's thinking. Yes, uh, who ultimately turned out to be Karl Rove. And he said this to journalist Ron Suskind. The aide said that guys like me are in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world really works anymore. No. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality judiciously as you will, we'll act again creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors. We call ourselves John Wilkes Boothers. No, I just threw that in there. Mm. And you, all <laughs> of you, will be left to just study what we do. What do we do? Okay, and that was Karl Rove at the time – this is Charlie Sykes, when everything is possible and nothing is true. And he talks about, um, you know, fake news. Hmm. And uh, he gives an example. There's a great uh, Churchill story, which isn't true. Oh. Uh, but that's why it's a great story. Apocryphal. Apocryphal, as they say. Churchill, madam, would you sleep with me for five million pounds? And the socialite says, my goodness, Mr. Churchill, I, I suppose. Churchill said, well, how about five pounds? And the socialite said, Mr. Churchill, what kind of woman do you think I am? And Churchill says, Madam, we've already established that. We're simply haggling about the price. It's an apocryphal story. Charlie Sykes uses it as an example of fake news because it's a famous anecdote and it's been attributed to George Bernard Shaw, Groucho Marx, Mark Twain, W.C. Fields, Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, and actually Woodrow Wilson. And he says, in time, it'll probably be ascribed to Donald Trump. But the story comes to mind when they're talking about whether or not it really matters whether or not you tell the truth anymore. And he uh, gives examples of, you know, the many times that Trump has a, uh, a vague and passing relationship with the truth. And then he points out this is where Hannah Arendt once again proves her indispensability. Trumpism's blending of tribalism with transactionalism is also reflected in what Arendt uh, uh, I identified as the curiously varying mixture of gullibility and cynicism in demagogic politics. Mm -hmm. The developments are parallel as tribalism provides a mass political base that helps politicians and pundits alike rationalize the bargains they make. Okay, And what she said is, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing and think that everything was possible, but nothing was true. And this is yeah. in uh, from her book, The uh, Origins of Totalitarianism. Gulp. Okay. Yeah, exactly. 
Mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd, and did not particularly object to being deceived because it held every statement to be a lie anyway. The totalitarian totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that under such conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism. Instead of deserting the leaders who had lied to them, they'd protest that they'd known all along the statement was a lie and would admire the leaders for their superior tactical cleverness. Mm. Now, you see this all the time when we talk politics. Oh, it's a three-dimensional chess, right. and you are just playing checkers. No, the guy lied and he blundered. No, 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 you just can't see how this was brilliant the way I do. Yes, uh, although it does, it happens even among, not necessarily among the followers. I mean, certainly people who are insisting that uh, there's a grand design or plan to the things that Trump is doing, as opposed to he's just lying from minute to minute. He you is, know. but Arendt, un- as, as uh, Charlie Sykes says, Arendt understood the end game here. Oh, well, a tsunami of lies isn't aimed at getting people to believe what the propagandist is saying. It's to induce chronic disbelief or an indifferent shrug. Who knows what to believe anymore? Who cares? What's the truth? How do you know? Right. Well, I guess that's a a similar question. Does anybody – I'm not sure that Trump gets to that level. I'm sure there are people around him who say – you know, like Stephen Miller seems like the kind of person and and Steve Bannon the kind of person who would say, yeah, yeah, well, uh, all of these lies – have a very specific purpose. We're trying to tear down, you know, the conventional establishment politics and rebuild it from the ground up. Whereas Trump is just like, I don't, I just want to get out of here. I just want to get watch money, television. Right? But, but the way that it's constructed is this all emoluments thing, for example. Yeah. I mean, the, the norms aren't there anymore. Who, right. Who's to know what's oh, really going effect. on there? And, and besides, I'm just bored of the whole thing. Okay, so he's getting a lot of money from places that he shouldn't be getting it. And he goes to Mar-a-Lago every week. Everybody knows that. It's like old news. Right. I mean, that's so the effect she, that she writes that the sense people. by which we take our bearings in the real world and the category of truth versus falsehood is among the mental means to this end is being destroyed. So now nobody pays attention to that anymore mm-hmm. because, like, that's the new norm. Yes. And that's the whole point of doing all of this stuff. You can't just do the one thing because everybody will focus on it. You got to do a hundred things so that nobody can pay attention anymore. Yeah, I mean, I I do think that that's somebody's idea of a broad strategy. I just don't know if it's that's Trump's. Trump's, and I think he knows that instinctually, and that's that's something he's quite right about and very good. And his training in New York with the tabloids taught him oh. that there's always another story another day. Just change the topic. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a. I think that's probably the most advanced lesson he was ever able to really draw from this. Is this works for me, and people don't care about stuff. Yeah, and I don't really need to know why. You go yeah. analyze why. Right. I don't care. It just and works for me. I'm going to do it for that. Or yeah, some rotating cast of people. I'm not attach thinking about it. I just do it because that. it works. Okay, yeah. and I'm smarter than you because I'm in the White House and you're not. So shut up. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's what he thinks. It's Stephen Miller and others who are in their offices calculating and saying the reason that you know we do this is because I want to rebuild American society. And Donald Trump is like, I don't care whether you rebuild. Well, it or you know, not. the other way is that uh, Miller or somebody like that, maybe in an earlier day when he actually had access, is that uh, John Kelly would come in with a list of things of how to be a jerk. You know, here's your list of things to choose from today, Mr. Trump. Hmm. Mr. President, what kind of jerky thing do you want to do today? Thank what you. do you want to do tomorrow? Let's let's plan. We, you need some planning here. He seems like a guy who would think planning is necessary. Yeah. And Trump will say, I'll just, you know, I don't know, have a news conference this afternoon. I'll just be a jerk. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason to plan it. I'll come up. But trust me, I can do it. I can wing being a jerk. Mm. So what I does he do yesterday? He pulls out of the Iran deal. Right. Well. Uh, yes, although I am constantly reminded, people say, well, it's not that he nullified or pulled out of it. It's that he intentionally violated it, was another way of looking at it. Well, here's some. Uh, I had this in the Pundit Roundup today. I have various yes. and sundry uh, people trying to summarize this. Uh, Michelle Kosinski tweets, senior European diplomat on dealing with State Department today, re Iran. All is a shambles there. Total incoherence between state and the National Security <laughs> Council. No one has any clue on the day after. There is no strategy. And uh, CNN's Am- Amanpour, Christian Amanpour. Oh, I would describe yeah. pulling out of this deal 
as possibly the greatest deliberate act of self-harm and self-sabotage in geostrategic politics in the modern era. Richard Engel reports, a fallen policy expert not known for emotional or blunt language told me rejecting the Iran deal was the stupidest thing Trump has done in foreign policy, shows the U.S. doesn't care what its closest allies think and is no longer a responsible steward of international security. Is that bad? Harwood writes, ex-CIA chief Brennan on Trump withdrawal from Iran nuclear deal, not just foolish, a dangerous, dangerous act. And of course, Brett Stevens wrote a column today in the New York Times about how, bore, how uh, bold and wonderful it was. Huh. Well, yeah, of course, because because Obama, everybody knows that. <laughs> well, that's again. I, the and and layers... believe me, I've just summarized the entire reasoning in the entire column <laughs> because of I believe it. That's the reasoning that happens in the sort of the outer shells around the uh, the idiot nucleus of of Trump. The people in the outer uh, uh, reaches are are building this wall of oh, it's a strategy, and can't you see how brilliant it is? And in the middle, he's just bouncing incoherently around inside a nucleus. Don't care where I'm headed. Right. Uh, and then his uh, his uh, supporters say, well, this is exactly what we want. We want him to disrupt everything. Right. NATO, uh, peace, prosperity. Us, we want it all disrupted. Ourselves. More cave-ins at work, please. You right. know. And, and, you know, so you have to step back and ask the question, well, that, that's all well and good. What are you getting out of this? Me? What is it? What is it that supporters of Nothing. Trump get out oh, of what them. he's oh, doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, corporations and Republicans what? and rich people get tax breaks. Okay, they yeah. get that. The deregulators get to see stuff deregulated, see EPA and oh. and see the uh, uh, the the you know the finance uh, uh, protection, the consumer protection boards go away. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the white nationalists get to see uh, uh, white nationalism promoted at the right. highest levels. So that's why they're all happy, and they think, you know, hey, he's he's at least delivering on what he promised me. That's true. And among the regular folks who don't fit into any of those categories, now uh, what you people know, have to keep in mind is stuff. that that's at best forty percent of the population, and at worst, probably closer to twenty-five. But that's why Trump's numbers stay the way they are. The fifteen percent, the, the difference between twenty-five and forty, uh -huh. um, is a group of people who don't like him personally, but are okay with his policies, whatever those policies are, assuming they even know what those policies are, or people who said, oh, look, I voted for him. And uh, if I had to do it again, I'd still do it because I didn't like that other person. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens. So that's a, a persuadable group in the end, but he's always going to have his core 25% that are just never going to change. And what's fascinating to me his numbers really are not up, despite the fact that you will hear people say that ticked up a point. Big deal. He's got this narrow range. It never moves. And that's his ceiling. And he's not breaking that ceiling. He's alienating everybody else. And when it comes time to vote, that's when you see it. You're not going to see it from the pundits. You know, my my uh, title for the pundit roundup today was on primary day, the voters decide, not the pundits. That's what happened yesterday. Hmm. Yes, and so we right. had a bunch of primaries I want to just uh, get in before I leave because uh, I think they were important. But uh, on the Democratic side, as uh, Kyle Kondik points out, for all the talk of insurgent strength on the uh, D side, not really backed up by government uh, by uh, governor primaries. Mm -hmm. Northam in Virginia, Murphy in New Jersey, Cordray in Ohio, Pritzker in Illinois. They're all the establishment choices. That's who won. Cordray just absolutely skunked Dennis Kucinich yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I heard about that one. Um, so, uh, you know, basically that's what happened. So, you know, the, the, the insurgency on the Democratic side is being subsumed by let's just win. And uh, that's, in fact, what's happening. Uh, on the Republican side, Don Blankenship, of course, the, the, the flagship primary, uh, the one everybody was watching, uh, Blankenship came in third. And uh, the winner there is a fellow named uh, Patrick Morrissey, who's going to take on Joe Manchin. And that'll be a an interesting contest. Um, the the huge, gigantic nutcases tended not to win on the Republican side either. They, yeah, I, well, I mean, minus the big one uh they haven't typically which is uh well which is why they were uh hitting the panic button a little late but 
hitting the panic right, now, button. Now, the year. biggest story that came out of yesterday at primaries probably is North Carolina 9. Okay. okay. One that we had mentioned. Good. Uh, you may rem- remember that we, we talked about the fact that there were two North Carolina Congress critters who were semi in trouble and were getting the wake up call from Kevin McCarthy that you better do something or you're going to lose in November. One of them was named Bud, B U D D, and the other one yeah. was Robert Pittenger. Pittenger. Yes. Oh, right. I saw that this morning. It turned out Pittenger lost this primary. Yeah. Was that the warning, though? It wasn't that you were going to lose your primary. It was that. Yeah, the warning your... was you're going to lose in November. They didn't yeah. see him losing the primary, but he actually lost the primary. Oops. So he was beaten by a conservative pastor or ex pastor named Mark Harris, who's a Freedom Caucus type, and Pittenger was backed by the Republican establishment. So they took oh. a solid Republican seat. In fact, I'll let Kyle Conduct describe it. Crystal right, ball Kyle. house ratings change. Now open North Carolina 9 moves from leans R to toss up. Hmm. Okay. Just so because they got rid of their the Democrats can win incumbent. because the incumbent lost. Yeah. Uh so he, he get outflanked from the right, essentially. Yes. I guess so. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's the he's another they one were of these guys that was just not prepared for an actual competitive race because that's not how he won. Didn't get any nothing. Nothing in the box. Uh, I don't I, have this in front of me. I think he just got in in 2013. It's not like he was there for 20 years. Yeah, I think we looked at. I looked that up the other day. The two of them, and I think he was the less experienced of the two. But there's nothing in the box about what to do for primaries because. That's the box. I bought the primary by purchasing the box, how to be a candidate. It didn't tell me what to do if somebody else buys either a different box or the latest version with more conservative nonsense in it. Uh, I wasn't supposed to have that problem. I thought I bought this franchise in this area and you were supposed to keep other Republicans out. Right. So... um... I will just conclude with just throwing something else in here because just throw it. Uh, you, you hate to to have it not be covered. This is yes. a James Holman piece from yesterday. Five overshadowed stories today spotlight Trump's domestic priorities in between oh, yeah. the Iran deal and uh, the primaries. People are not paying attention to this, but he highlights one: separating immigrant parents from their children as policy. Two: mm-hmm. rolling back anti-segregation rules at HUD. That's yes. what I meant about the white supremacists getting what they want. True. Three, taking funding back from CHIP. Mm. He wants to do rescissions. They're not oh, going to fly, right, right, but that's right. what he wants to do. Yes. Number four is raising premiums for sick people. And number five, gutting the CFPB. That's the Consumer Protection Board that Cordray used to run. Now yeah. he's uh, out and running for uh, governor of Ohio. But all of those are horrible domestic policy prescriptions, they are suggestions that the Trump administration is trying to put through, whether that works or whether that doesn't work is unclear. And I mention it because uh, Greg Sargent had this really nice piece the other day about summarizing um, what was going on in terms of local races. Uh, we, We talked about this on the show, I think on Monday, we did the Ron Brownstein piece about how people are running locally on things like healthcare. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Sargent points out that uh, on the one hand, Nate Silver summarizing the fact that Trump's numbers really don't change that much and they're certainly not going up. And on the other hand, uh, Brownstein highlights how Democrats are winning locally with local issues, just like in Virginia, uh, you know, uh, the person who uh, got a, uh, a state position did it because uh, she talked about traffic yes. and, and uh, local issues that mattered to people. That's what Democrats yes. are doing as well. So you don't have to highlight Trump all the time and the whole idea that, oh, well, what do Democrats stand for? They, they're not running on anything except anti-Trump. It's simply not true. Trump is such a jerk. It's out there. You don't even have to talk about it. It's there whether you talk about it or not. You can concentrate on policy and the policy things that we're talking about are, are some of those things that uh, James Holman highlighted. And at the same time, you don't win on policy, you win by telling a story and a narrative. And the narrative really is that you elected Republicans to go to Washington and what they did and what they are doing is screwing you. And they're screwing you in a bunch of different ways. They're screwing you on the tax reform that's only helping the one percenters. They're screwing you on health care because they try to 
uh, get rid of Obamacare. They couldn't. Now they're sabotaging it. And the end result is your premiums are going up by double digits. They did that. And that's enough to win. Oh. All right. We should. And we should and we will. So All right. uh, we'll see what happens. I assign that job. Right. See, those anyway, so that's my summary of everything that happened yesterday, which is difficult because there's a lot that happened yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But who knew this much about John Wilkes Booth? Uh, n- well, that guy from oh, John uh, yeah, uh, from the uh, Mo- University in Montreal. <laughs> what was it? Uh, he knew it offhand, although, again, he did not get to the, the monograms on the cuff. I am upset about that. Well, but, that's your job is to yes. bring in that stuff. And right, you know, right. Stuff yes, there, right? that's that's true. Oh, I forgot. I knew I had today? something to do here. No, she's not. She's doing the job of running DailyCoast.com as everybody else, uh, for whatever reason, retreating from doing the job. Uh, that is to say, uh, on retreat and uh, planning the the path forward going into the elections and beyond. But yeah, so she's a little tied up. She's busy. And then uh, and then after that, she goes straight into vacation. We're not going to hear from Joan for a little while, at least in her regular slot. But of course, well, you know, I did my part. Pieces. And as Kenneth Mars famously said in Blazing Saddles, you're on your own. I guess so. All right. Well, the rest of the show okay. will have to be about John Wilkes and other people named John Wilkes. Yeah, exactly right. All right. Take care, happened. and I will talk to you tomorrow. All right. Thanks very much, Greg. We'll see you tomorrow. There's this, there's an awful lot to catch up on, and I didn't even uh, – I, I don't think he mentioned in the roundup piece of things that didn't get mentioned, uh, there was a – we did mention the other day the the, uh, the anti-bullying initiative thing, thingy-majiggy, whatever it is that, that Melania – sort of kind of put together. And I've seen some explanation, by the way, after the fact about that, that I guess people in the administration were backpedaling and saying, well, this this reworked piece from the Federal Trade Commission wasn't meant to be an original work of Melania Trump. It was simply a, a relaunch of the same material under new pretext, I guess. Uh, but... Anyway, uh, it, was, it was interesting that that, that piece, that two o, Daily 202 piece was illustrated by, with a photo from the event, which I thought was kind of humorous. They have the, that Be Best poster up there, which looks like they – I mean, I guess it was made to look like maybe kids had made the poster and painted it themselves or something. And hopefully uh, – hopefully they did. Hopefully they actually had kids paint that poster. But uh, a picture of the event, which I gather must have been in the Rose Garden or whatever, one of the outdoor venues at uh, the White House where they do such things on a nice day. And Donald Trump, of course, had to be in it because it was an event. So there he was. And, you know, very often presidents come in support of and to lend some extra something, whatever it might be, to the events hosted by the First Lady or – or whatever, backed by the first lady. But of course, he has to like have a role in it. Like other presidents, they go and they say, what a great thing, you know, the first lady is doing and it's terrific and we should all be a part of it. But he had to sign something. So he had to arrange it. Let there be a proclamation there for me to sit down at my stupid little kid sized desk and sign with a giant magic marker and make my wife observe that. This is only happening because I'm willing to sign this paper, Melania. You should know that. So I like that he uh, included that in the event. All right, let's see. Uh, Armando, of course, uh, has uh, lots to say about the LLC, the uh, essential consultants, etc. That is, of course, the name of the LLC that Michael Cohen has been using for all sorts of purposes. And we got to get to that. And uh, the the door should be open for that. I guess other pieces I would like to round up or other stories that I'll round up, I'll do quickly while we uh, wait to hear from him or, or get some direction from him. Let's just turn the show over to our mother. No, I know that uh, this is one of those days and, and the events swirling today, stuff that ha- probably none of you can keep from uh, uh, blurting out <laughs> – about but but only Armando will will be able to call in and blurt them out to the rest of you but it's usually worth having him do that don't you think let me round up a few more stories things that happened uh via Twitter that I saw during the top of the show that I said oh yeah that's something I want to add too I noticed this piece yesterday Tim Kaine 
now addressing the issue of the four U.S. soldiers killed in the ambush last year in Niger, or Niger, I guess is how you would say it, uh, uh, but pointing out that I guess after considerable investigation, they still have been unable to come up with any sort of legal authorization for the mission they were supposedly engaged in when they were ambushed. And he says he believes they were engaged in a mission that they were not authorized by law to participate in and that they were not trained to participate in. And one wonders when the massive congressional investigation into this new Benghazi is going to be launched. And of course, the answer is it will never be launched so long as there is a Republican Congress in place, uh, which I guess leads us to a number of other similar stories, including the uh, the latest on Devin Nunes, who turns out to be, well, quite a traitor, uh, as it happens. Not T-R-A-D-E-R, but traitor, that kind of trader and uh we'll, we'll let's get to the story that uh has people talking about that the Washington Post has this piece here and there was a lot of discussion of it on Twitter last night secret intelligence source who aided Mueller probe is at center of latest clash between Nunes and the Justice Department I told you Briefly, I think well, it was more than briefly yesterday that Nunes is threatening to try to hold Jeff Sessions in contempt of Congress. And it's because the Justice Department has thus far refused to comply with a subpoena issued by the uh, by by Nunes the the committee from which he has, of course, recused himself. And uh, there are some very good reasons why. And as a matter of fact, even the administration, despite their hope that Nunes will diffuse a, some situation or another for them by getting this information, has actually stood by the Justice Department on this one. We'll, we'll clear it all up, maybe, after one short break. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back now to the Kid Go in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I have open... The, uh, like I say, uh, very often the dry toast of the story, but there's lots of good tweeting yesterday pointing out Nev Devin Nunes is really uh, uh, on his way to uh, lasting infamy here. The things he's getting himself tangled up in. Robert Costa has the lead spot on the byline here. Carol Leonig, De uh, Devlin Barrett and Shane Harris also on the byline. Here last Wednesday, senior FBI and national intelligence officials. Ah, here comes Armando. Hang on just a second, Armando. Uh, I'm rounding up another major crime. <laughs> just a second here, and then we'll get around to the other major crime of the day. But uh, Robert Costa taking the lead on this report of last Wednesday, senior FBI and national intelligence officials relayed an urgent message to the White House. Information being sought by House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes, because he's so recused, could endanger a top-secret intelligence source. Top White House officials with the assent of President Trump agreed to back the decision to withhold the information. Not that that'll... Eventually, Trump will be tweeting about how angry he is that DOJ is withholding the information. They were persuaded that turning over Justice Department documents could risk lives by potentially exposing the source, a U.S. citizen who has provided intelligence to the CIA and FBI, according to multiple people familiar with the discussion and the person's role. The showdown marked a rare moment of alignment between the Justice Department and Trump, who has relentlessly criticized Attorney General Jeff Sessions and other top justice officials for the probe into Russia's interference in the election, uh, led by Robert Mueller, as you know. But it is unclear whether Trump was alerted, <laughs> you have to alert him, to a key fact, not because the president's not just going to know key facts. Somebody has to alert him to it. That information developed by the intelligence source has been provided to the Mueller investigation. Now, the debate over the risk to the source is now at the center of a pitched battle between House Republicans and the Justice Department. After the White House sided with the department's decision to refuse the request, Nunes publicly vented his frustration, saying Sunday that he might try to hold Sessions in contempt for refusing to comply. 
He said that his classified document request and subsequent subpoena to the Justice Department did not refer to an individual. What's essentially happening here is uh, he wants information that the Justice Department has determined could expose an important source of, of some sort of information to the risk of, well, the risk of exposure and death. And the White House backed the DOJ uh, uh, reasoning in balking at providing the document. But now Devin Nunes is basically saying, if I can get the information, though someone may be killed, it could have the effect of either contaminating and ruining or shutting down all or some part of the Mueller probe into, well, everything. For, again, that probe from which I've recused myself repeatedly, but keep meddling in. And he's basically saying, let's kill national security assets in order to do this. And it might even turn out to be like, let's kill somebody who's helping Mueller, essentially, and uh, have the Russian mob witness him trip and fall down 1,100 flights of stairs, for instance, as frequently happens with people who cross the, uh, the Russians who are involved in most of this stuff. But Devin Nunes putting himself out there as, I guess, uh, pro-murder on um, when it comes to uh, political opponents and astonished that all of a sudden the Trump White House has agreed that perhaps having those people killed is not a good idea. And he seems convinced that if he could just get through to the president, he could convince him that the person who will be rubbed out is a threat to him personally and so maybe he can change his mind on it after all. That's that's the level on which Devin Nunes continues to operate. And that's just one yeah. of several major crimes we have to wrap up for the day. Uh, but let's now wait. flip there's back. One, there's oh, one yeah. very important part of that article. Yes. I don't know if you got to it. Not uh, yet, probably. Read Paul Re Ryan's reaction. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, I, have, I, I did see people referring to it. Yesterday, I, I, so what does he say specifically? But basically, he's he's agreed not to uh, do anything whatsoever. He says he's not discussed the matter with Nunes, but added that he expected congressional subpoenas to be enforced. We expect the administration to comply with our document requests, which is actually quite dumb. So he's actually, uh, I mean, it's sort of a dumb position. Well, I, I mean, I guess that's the default position of the Speaker of the House. We expect our requests for documents to be complied with. But uh, unless unless, of course, you know, it could endanger national security or hurt Republicans, which David. Yeah. Criminal investigation information has oh. never been subpoenaed oh, yes, by the Congress. That, that national security also. information of this type has never been subpoenaed by the Congress. You usually to say yeah. generally we expect them to be complied goes to the point. They should yes. never be subpoenaed. Yes, that's true. And Paul that's, Ryan is a disgrace, and he's backing Nunes on this. This is the sort of thing that usually you strategically back away from or require or advise gently that others back away from because you, you run into situations where you say, well, yeah, we expect our our document requests and even subpoenas to be complied with, and it's one of the reasons we try to be careful about what gets subpoenaed because if you go to the mattresses, on something that that shouldn't be subpoenaed there's every chance that you won't get it and then you'll have failed and then they'll uh, and, you know they might advise you even well now now there's precedent for denying congressional subpoenas on the books as opposed to just sort of floating out there as a general theory like don't request national security information that's too dangerous to give you and if there's anybody more dangerous to give it to than serial leaker Devin Nunes, I couldn't imagine. I mean, there's no chance that could be held in confidence. He only requests documents with an eye toward leaking them. Okay, exactly. And and leaking them to the targets of the investigation. Yes. I mean, that, look, well, but it's it's yeah. it's just wrong. Imagine <laughs> I should it's say February that. of 2019 and House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin New, uh, Devin New, Adam Schiff yeah. requested these exact same documents, but for other purposes, mm -hmm. to leak that Trump's a crook or in league with the Russians. Yes, well, of course, they would oppose, oppose that. Uh, it would be fun to have, but it would be the sort of thing that they'd like to not request because someone, would, someone responsible would tell them, 
not only would you cause tremendous problems, but you're not likely to actually get your hands on these things. So turn your attention elsewhere. It's just you don't, at least as of, except until Devin Nunes and Paul Ryan, that wasn't something that was in question. Yes. All of a sudden it is. It's outrageous. And Paul Ryan is, is Devin Nunes is what he is. And we've always known what he is since the day he took something to the White House. Yeah. Uh, walked back to Congress and said, I have this thing and I'm going to take it to the White House. Right. Uh, we knew what he is, and now we know what Paul Wright is. He's no better than Devin Nunes. Yes. Uh, well, that's true. And and that we've known – well, some of us have suspected we've it for a long for time. A long but time. we but have known it. Pre- yeah. has pretended they didn't know. Uh, well, they, yeah, they've pretended. But uh, I guess they – I was going to say we've all known for sure, including the press, uh, since – he was caught on tape saying, let's keep all this a secret so that Republicans continue to win political power domestically. It's treason, yep. but don't worry about it because we can get tax cuts, fix parking tickets, uh, you know, and, and get nice houses in Florida or whatever it is we're all here for. Uh, we'll all cash in personally if we just stay tight lipped about this. Right. Right. Well, it's also Paul Ryan's personal fortunes i guess he yeah. doesn't want he wants to be seen because i guess he will run for president in 2024 or whatever his plan is yeah it's uh, or who knows what he's going to do uh he doesn't want to lead this house and who can blame him mm-hmm. but he also isn't going to you know sabotage yes. his own standing with the trumpsters of the republican party yeah at a minimum uh, no jail that's what he's looking for well, it could be that. Maybe he's hiding something that, that directly implicates him. I, that The questions are raised by his behavior. Yeah. And what's on tape, which is part <laughs> of his behavior. All right. Well, that's true. Uh, uh, it's important to get that out there because he thinks he's going to retire and walk away from the uh, the dumpster fire of indictments and criminal liability. and. And he shouldn't. But historically in this country, we'll let you go. If you walk away early enough. Gina Haspel's back. And today her, yes. is her hearing. And she was intimately involved in the torture regime. And uh, yeah. everyone's saying, hey, you can't hold that against her. She was just following orders. Literally, they said that. You were just following <laughs> orders. That works. Well, a lot <laughs> of lessons were drawn from World War II. And world wars are full of lessons. That's the point really, of studying them. And that might not be why we fight them necessarily, but uh, you can be pretty sure. Have a world war. Go ahead and, and, and try and do it without making a point. That's what I say. Well, you, can't. you know, and, and again, to be both sides of the on you, you know, we did the same thing with John Brennan, or rather the Obama administration. Mm-hmm. John Brennan should have been disqualified from being CIA director. Yeah. Uh, he was part of the torture regime as well. Yes. But... And so, so therefore, again, it's, it's not just Republicans on this. I actually called in because Chris Como is, uh, is grinding my gears. OK, so, what's he doing? <laughs> but I, I think it's a good opportunity to go through this LLC business, uh, specifically the Essential Consultings LLC, that just as a matter of record was formed on October 17, 2016, by one Michael Cohen. Um, I tweeted out, I should have sent it to you, the original Articles of Formation uh, to form that Delaware Corporation. It's a one-page document. It actually does not list the lawful purpose. Perhaps there's a different document that I've not seen where he does list uh, the purpose of the LLC. Generally speaking, in my experience, and I don't generally form Delaware Corporations. I do Florida LLCs uh, for, for because mostly that's from my clients who need them are. Um, you have to put a lawful purpose, and my general practice is to use the phrase "any lawful purpose." Yeah. Uh, so basically, it doesn't really restrict what the LLC can do. Some people will say, "Well, just for real estate or whatever other reason," but I don't see any. As a lawyer, I don't see any reason to do that because I can do that and still do other things if if the purpose of the LLC changes. But they talk about essential consultings. Chris Cuomo is insisting that it's not a shell corporation. 
okay. all morning, all day on Twitter up to now. It's incredibly ignorant for him to say that. What is a That's shell corporation? Not a shell cor- I mean, I don't, I'm not even certain that that. Okay, let's well, let's entertain it. What is a shell corporation? A shell corporation is a non-operating entity that it generally is used to house assets okay. or to receive income. I'll give you uh, an example that I have made shell corporations for. Uh, I have a client who has uh, licensed certain uh, intellectual property. Okay. Uh, the intellectual property was then used to secure uh, a debt for a loan. We housed the intellectual property in a shell corporation doesn't operate it just owns the assets and has the right to receive the royalties on the assets okay it doesn't operate it doesn't do anything there's nothing nefarious about it in this sense there's legal purpose there's nothing illegal okay. we're not going to hide it from anybody it does account in fact work. uh you know there'll be a, a public ucc filing uh where all the assets of that shell corporation will be pledged uh, to secure a loan okay it's a shell corporation. All it does is take in royalties and pay the uh, rightful owner money. Right. Well, okay. the, the members or the shareholders of the LLC. Okay. Uh, oh, in, in many states, we refer to those as members instead of shareholders. Member units. I see. Uh, is the equivalent of shares. And you do it for any number of reasons. There may be tax reasons. There, I, I explained to you my reasoning when I've done it, which is to isolate the asset that's going to be secured for the pledge for the loan. Yes. Uh, th- that's a perfectly legit, in my view, you may disagree uh, no, with I mean, it, but it's legal. Uh, I'll put we, it that. I keep bringing that up. Is a lot of people do that, like normal, everyday people who want to keep businesses distinct and separate. That's the reason <clears throat> that you form those things. And I don't know if it was the reasoning for your client, but it may very well be that anybody would say, I own, <clears throat> pardon me, I own several pieces of property, one of which is going to be pledged as collateral for a loan. But if I just have it in my other company where I own a bunch of stuff and I default on the loan or something goes wrong with the deal, someone can sue me and attach all sorts of other assets. But not if the only asset of the debtor is this piece of property because that's all there is in this company. That's why you would do it. That's the limitation part. Yes, oh. exactly. That's the whole idea. That's why I couldn't and, understand you know, why Michael Cohen was commingling uh, sex bribe money and political consulting money, if that's what it well, was. If, that's, if it, it was isn't. political consulting money. Yeah. Point is, Michael Cohen's not an employee. Apparently, Consensual Consulting's never even had offices. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Right, we're, all, we're all coughing and choking. Anything like yes. that. All right, yeah, it's a post office let, box thing, maybe. Let me let me illustrate what is not a shell corporation. That's fine. Give okay, you an idea. Suppose uh, I represent a company, and they want to operate a separate standalone business, but they want to consolidate the financials. So they create what's called a wholly owned subsidiary. Okay, that subsidiary will have its own employees, its own bank accounts, its own board of directors, its own executives and officers. Okay. It will operate. Yes. And for financial reporting purposes, you might just flow all the all the financial results up to the parent, uh, et cetera. You know, that there's tax reasons. There's reasons for financing. There's many reasons why you would do it. But that's not a shell corporation. It's an operating company. I get you. Yes. All right. People go to a work. A corporation there. doesn't operate. That's the whole point. They say, "Where do you work?" I work at X Y Z. All right, X Y Z is not a shell corporation, as right. opposed to a shell corporation. No one would say, "I work there." They might say, "I own it," but they don't say, right. "I work there." Right. And Donald Trump has eight million uh, LLCs, but most of them are not shell corporations. They actually own and operate. Uh, either through a management company, they'll create a you know a management company, or they won't. Maybe they'll just put in the assets in there, and and let the management company in a separate corporation run the facility. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have not digged He's through got how several Trump does. Let's types. say the Doral Golf Club. I don't know what his corporate structure is with that. Yeah. Uh, but there might be a shell corporation in there, and it might be completely 
legal and innocent. I, the, 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 but the first point is it is a shell corporation, Essentials Consulting. Uh, that, that's just what it is. Now, All if, right. it, is Cuomo trying to say, well, to remove the idea that, that it is by definition nefarious? Well, what he needs to say is so. not that it's not a shell corporation. He needs to say that not all shell corporations are nefarious. Yeah. Uh, it's not hard. But there's lots of indications that, in fact, this particular shell corporation is nefarious. <laughs> yeah, and there's, that's fine reporting. Not all shell corporations are nefarious. This isn't this is a shell corporation. Not all shell corporations are nefarious, but this one is. Okay. This one looks like it is for a couple of reasons. Yes. You've met, you know, the intermingling, of course, is just bad lawyering. Yes. That, and I think at this point, the notion that Cohen is not a bad lawyer seems not indefensible. Plausible. It's not. Yeah. OK. It's um, bad. And I'll, I think Josh Marshall points out something that's always been bizarre to me. Uh, I thought it was bizarre before I knew that he used this essential co- consultant holdings or essential essential consulting LLC mm-hmm. for this stuff. Uh, was why did Michael Cohen fight Stormy Daniels on this D- uh, D- D- NDA? He didn't have to do that. He could have just said, well, you're going to do what you're going to do and we'll not say anything about it. But he's, you know, he he went to he fought it and then he started an arbitration and he's in the middle of litigation. And, you know, what happens when a party is in a litigation, of course, is by and large in most civil litigation, I'll get to see your financials. It'll be held in confidence, et cetera. There'll be uh, <clears throat> lots of reasons not to disclose what's in there. But I'll get to see it. And I'm going to put that company in play. It's going to be an issue. Yeah. Michael Cohen knew what he was doing with this essential consultings LLC, and he went for it anyway. There's there's two explanations. Uh, both could be true, but they don't they don't necessarily both have to be true. It could just be that Cohen is that stupid, or it could be his boss is that stupid or didn't know that. Cohen was doing these things and insisted hmm. that he move forward to enforce the NDA against Stormy Daniels. His boss, of course, being Donald J. Trump. Yes, yes. So all that comes out the light. So what do we know? We know he took money from ATT, Novad- Novartis, Novartis. Sorry. Novartis, yes. And uh, Uh, A Russian uh, oligarch who his cousin, his American cousin is denying that the the Russian oligarch has anything to do with it. But, you know, (laughs) okay, Uh, we'll see about that. Um, I forgot the other companies that were involved. Then those are who we know of right now. And he got what, over four million dollars in that account. Yeah, uh, that's one of the numbers I heard. Yeah. I, and I didn't go through all the math, and we've heard the identified names, and I think they, you know, the amounts that were paid are, are suspicious. Um, one, the Novartis one, people are trying to figure out because there's no reporting requirement. Uh, someone speculated, and it sounds plausible, that the amounts that were paid may have been to uh, be circumscribed within the executive power granted by the corporation to the CEO at that time that he could, you know, he had the freedom to hire people up to 90 to own less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, or rather a month. I forget how much the amounts were. Or, anyway, add it all up. And what the total amount was might have been uh, something that the CEO could do yeah, okay. uh, without any further approvals. Um, could be. I don't. That that doesn't sound particularly convincing to me. To, because generally speaking, a CEO can do pretty much what he wants within reason, uh, short of selling major assets and things like that. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that claim. But but the number is suspicious. It's weird that it came out that way, and I'm not sure why it is. Um, of course, the the main focus is on this money that uh, is linked to the Russian oligarch. <clears throat> and it raises tons of questions. What did they pay Cohen for? 
Uh, yeah, no one knows. I mean, the the cover story you would ordinarily offer <laughs> is uh, like what what AT and T and Novartis came up with. We want insights into Trump and how he works, and we're going to be lobbying. We do that. Uh, we're going to be lobbying the government, and uh, we. We want to know more about how to get, essentially, you know, how to get on his good side. And it's not illegal to ask that question. It's, it's everybody knows it's a wink, wink situation, but it's not illegal to ask. You know, the president is he going to go for this or not? I say I'll tell you if you pay me a hundred thousand right. dollars. Yes, or I'll give you a copy of the bribe menu if you pay me a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> exactly. But whatever it is, that 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 just strikes me as as, as sophistry. That that's a lobbying. Uh, it is, but it, yeah. it's the thing Cohen, that people do and Cohen get away didn't with. register as a lobbyist, which he should have done, which is another stupidity. He should have just registered. There was nothing preventing him from being a lobbyist. Mm -hmm. uh, Corey Lewandowski's a lobbyist. He's made yes. four million dollars doing oh, four million. But hmm. uh, yeah, he's he's supposedly made four million dollars too. It's Everybody's a, getting it seems four million. To be a nice round number for for things. Yeah. Um, the the the. I'll take it. Thing about Cohen, of course, is once you you look at Essential Consultings and you see what how he operated it, and you know he's got other skeletons in his closet the the flipping of the apartments, mm -hmm. uh, but then still being broke and having to take a home equity loan in October of 2016 or so Maybe. he says. Right. Again, I've never seen the home loan documents, but nope. I assume Robert Mueller has and the Southern District of New York has. Or has not and knows that they don't exist, one way or the other. That could be true, too. Uh, the The reality is there are tremendous questions, legitimate, tough questions here about what Cohen was doing, uh, yes. given his prior history, given the hush payments that he's now been known to make and of course you've probably touched on this new it sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory but if you read it it sounds less crazy that Brody was just a cutout for yeah. trump with this uh playmate i have who got the 1.6 yeah. million dollar payment i read the story i read it yesterday i had it up on my screen yesterday and i i didn't get to it but i i do i have the strongest feeling that somebody threw that out there as a theory without hashing it out a couple of days ago, and, and I hope that we actually mentioned it on the air, but it's a pretty well put together explanation. There's very little explanation for the original story, to be honest. And uh, I think one of the things that I said, I mean, one of the phrases I even used, it might have been about somebody else, but I said, I love judging books by their covers. And that was one of the things that I thought about when I saw, quite honestly, Elliot Broidy and, and this playmate. I don't know. I mean, he's rich, but... Uh, he's nobody who cares if yeah, he had an affair right and that's another thing there's no reason he would cover it up and there was never any reason it was always weird i know we talked about this it was like how does elliot Brody find out that the way to handle this situation is to hire the most obscure worst lawyer in america i know what i'll do i'll hire the I, literally one of the worst lawyers in america who has in fact just made the news at having zero success at keeping affairs covered up, and I'll have him try and cover up my affair. You know what's interesting about that is, and I think it, it, it the 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 reason this I would argue is buttressing the idea that it, it's really Trump uh, is Davidson, of course, is on the record as right. saying yeah, that, that he guy. called. Michael Cohen. Yes, that was the supposed explanation. Here's how Cohen got involved and how Broidy came to know him. I called and I put the two of them together, which is problematic in its own right. Uh, on every level, as lawyers, everything. Uh, so it, it was wrong. It's not confidential. Uh, Cohen would say, "Why are you call? You know, Norman reaction. Why are you calling me? I don't. Right. I don't know Elliot Broidy or." I don't represent him. Or why do you think I know Elliot Broy? Why would Keith Davidson think he, that Cohen has any relationship with Elliot Broy? Yeah, at that point, uh, the only excuse would be, well, I read on the RNC website that you're both deputy chairs for finance, which, okay, they are. You know, I mean, uh, conceivably, he could have looked it up and seen if uh, Cohen was implicated like Brody was. Brody's a convicted felon. Mm, oh, do you yes. know that? Uh, I am... He, he bribed. From time to time. He, he bribed. 
Alan Hevesy, uh, yes. the controller of New York. <laughs> that's back that's to 2009. Too. Yeah, good job. <laughs> I'm just, it's unbelievable the stuff that comes out. Yeah. Anyway, I hear the music, so right? I don't know if you want to keep talking about this after. Uh, break. Sure, why not? We'll continue. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a pretty major story. There's lots out there, and we'll uh, we'll round it all up and. And uh, maybe wrap up this one and wait for further developments after uh, this break. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Chatting away during the break. It is really a remarkable story uh, that that all, all, all of this has been discovered so quickly. Although, it, as it turns out, uh, well, uh, I was going to say the big mistake that I discussed at the top of the show that Michael Cohen makes the incredible mistake to make as a lawyer or just as a person with common sense who knows what the words limited liability means is that he commingles funds in a, in a, in a, I mean, he may have believed that he was going to get away with it and no one was ever going to see the financials of essential consulting, but the incredible laziness or stupidity or hubris that leads a lawyer, supposedly, who's really, if you're working for Donald Trump, it's more or less your job to create as many limited liability corporations as possible and put discrete pots of money in each one. To say, well, I have this one. Luckily, I already have one called Essential Consultants or Consulting LLC, and I, I have it in place, thank God, because I have to move money to Stormy Daniels very quickly and do it through a series of uh, you know, anonymous corporations. So, shoo, I don't have a 30-day delay waiting for the Secretary of State of Delaware to approve my formation of a new one. So I'll use this It takes one. two days. Okay, two Just days. So you and, know. All right, well, I don't know. I thought in some places it might be longer, but two days. And if you pay it up, you can get it the same day. Okay. Delaware. Well, that's nice. That seems like a good. It's like five hundred bucks for the one day service. So uh, you know, I'd be like, you know, I want to. I'll save money. I'll wait two days. But I wish I didn't have to. <laughs> but for these guys, obviously, whatever. So you can do it even in the same day. So once he finds out, for instance, hey, AT and T wants to give me two hundred thousand dollars for insight into Donald Trump, he could have gotten on the computer and. Built a new thing. You know, people ask me some every once in a while. I, I want to send you a, a check to donate to supporting Kagro in the morning, and I don't want to use Patreon. I don't want to use any online things. Where can I send it? And you know that I say very often to them, uh, "Hold on, let me think about it," because I don't want to like I, me. I'm like I'm not giving my address to whoever asks me through email. Yeah, you do a PO box, right? So I would go and get a PO box. But boy, you know, it's going to take me a while. There's no PO boxes available at my local post office. I could go to mailboxes, etc. It's fifty bucks a month. Do I really want and to get into this? You can't do it over online. Yeah, but, you know, you can build an LLC. You can create an LLC online. You right. don't have to even get up from your desk. Yes. So I mean, he could have done that and say, "I'm going to put all the money that corporations want to pay me." to consult with them in this other account. And that's all it takes. And by the way, it wouldn't be a shell, arguably not a shell corporation because you work at, a, I'm a consultant. And this is where all the people who want to pay me for my consulting pay, as opposed to this and this account is for porn stars. And I don't well, want that. What you've that. done is you've assigned your rights to consulting fees to essential consulting, unless you're going to make yourself an employee. Yes, I guess that's true. That. Uh, but uh, you, you certainly could have started a consulting company and kept it separate that way. But yeah, what, what the dumb thing is, is that once you are paying the porn star out of essential consulting, and that might not have been the first 
function of essential consulting. In fact, it might have been a consulting firm. But once you are commingling this and now there's an investigation into the porn star payments, people are going to say, all right, I need to see your books. And if your books are full of other things you don't want people to know about, that's where you go, oh, I should have started another one. <laughs> but honestly, you know, that should have occurred to a lawyer, a real lawyer would have known that from the beginning. I don't even give away my, I, I won't accept money from people because I worry about non-compartmentalization of essential information like my physical address. Michael Cohen, I, know, I guess you can put bribe money here. I'm going to write bribe on the envelope. Where do you want me to put this? Put it on the president's desk. I'll pick it up later. There's photographers coming in. Eh, what do, I don't, maybe they don't speak English. What do <laughs> I know? It says oh, bribe. Are you sure? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, people don't mind. That's basically the mistake he made. I was asking to get caught. It's it, you know, I, I fall back on the Watergate, all the president's men line uh, from Deep Throat, which is, mm -hmm. you know, these just aren't very bright guys. I guess that's it. But uh, but Kevin and, and Broy he, or uh, Elliot uh, Kevin for some reason I that Broidy wanted Elliot to, Broidy, gotta have him. You know, I, if you read that and we had left it, I guess we'll just can wrap it up. But the thing about I'll Broidy, why did Broidy do it? Why did why did he play the patsy? By the way, as someone points out, that's how John Edwards. That was John Edwards' first story. It was some campaign aids, baby. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good one. It's a yeah, great he, plan. You should use it. Yeah, well, it seems not to work. Oh, <laughs> it's, I think well, it's, minus it could, that, it though. End up otherwise, <laughs> yeah, it's it doesn't work at all, and you go to jail. But <laughs> besides that, it's great. We're back to the uh, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Like Lincoln is back in here. Uh, but the 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 uh, Brody, uh, just to wrap it up. Why would Elliot Brody care or, that anybody would know that he had an affair, other than his wife? Right. No, he would not. No one knows who he is, and it doesn't make any sense, which, you know, P.S., I also wondered, for instance, digging up dirt on the negotiators of the Iran deal. Like, oh, somebody I never heard of, but who negotiated the Iran deal has a skeleton in their closet? I don't care, I guess. I mean, unless it's Iran paid me and I knew that we were going to be arming them. Well, I assume that's what it was for, that there was some type of financial connection between interests that wanted to do business in Iran and people who negotiated the Iran deal. I, uh, that that wasn't the point. I it was. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I imagine that was the you mean, was that the point of the Iran deal? No, like, that was at the point of the trying to dig up, up the dirt. dirt. I imagine that's probably what they what someone smart hoped for. I, I fear it may have been Trump's idea that maybe there's a porn star. <laughs> you know, uh, but you have a porn star. But I know, but, but maybe they have one too, because everybody does. A projection. Oh, he, he saw he saw that West Wing episode where Sam Seaborn was sleeping with a prostitute. Oh, okay. Said, Aha! Right. That that could be it. Uh, by the way, all of this referencing. Uh, uh, well, that that part is a different story. But back to the uh, the theory on Brody. It, Paul Campos is the one who put together this piece for New York magazine. But I, I think I have seen it speculated elsewhere, though, for all I know, it may have been Paul no, Campos yeah. speculating about it. But I think I heard speculation immediately. Uh, I didn't think much of it. I mean, yeah, but but, you know, Campos goes through it. He says, boy, it's really good. All that information came out quickly. And Brody said, yeah, it was me. Right, as because to saying no, it wasn't me. Yeah, you know. just paid one point six million dollars to not have anyone find out. A first person who asked you, you said, "Yep, I did it." <laughs> it was okay. That's kind of weird. P.S. This playmate. I mean, granted that it's a Playboy playmate, so this is likely to happen. But she looks just like all the other people with <laughs> whom know. Trump has had affairs, Absolutely. and yeah. So, I mean, the, the basics of the story, I mean, the detail is incredible and it's well put together and, and I'll include it in the roundup and everyone should read it is like, well, who has a track record of doing exactly this? Donald Trump, who doesn't have any record whatsoever of doing this. 
Elliot Broidy. Now, uh, who, you know, who has real reason to pay $1.6 million to keep that quiet? Donald Trump. Who doesn't have that? Elliot Broidy. So I guess then they ask, well, why would he agree to do it? And the answer is he, Broidy, makes millions of dollars doing deals with the government and with others that can be influenced by Donald Trump and his inner circle. And so it's worth a tremendous amount of money to do this favor for Donald Trump. So he does it and he just tells his wife, listen, they're going to say I did this thing and I'm going to say I did this thing. I didn't do this thing. And I, honestly, if I did, it should be worth it to you that we're going to get millions and millions of dollars for this. But I didn't do it. So don't worry about it. I just have to walk around saying, oh, the shame of it all for a while. And then we'll get a bunch of money. That's it. And it's a really good explanation. And it makes a lot more sense than the idea that this smart, savvy thief. Crook. uh, Yeah. uh, Broidy uh, decided that when confronted with a problem, he would hire the worst lawyer he could find that he knew nothing about. And then he would admit to the to the deed on top of it. That doesn't none of that. None of that adds up. Not the circumstances, not the idea that she would be involved with him. But who knows? Money makes people do weird things. Um, also, that she would get possibly paid out of the same shell corporation. And also, oddly, that she would have the identical NDA and that the guy who didn't even have the energy, the stamina to start a new LLC didn't even change the fake names on the NDA. Or and essential consulting is a yeah. third party to that agreement too. Which yeah. Is another. Which is another weird thing and that doesn't make any sense. And of course, another explanation for it being the exact same kind of deal and exact same NDA is it was covering the exact same guy, Donald Trump. Now granted yeah, Peggy Peterson sense. was a different Peggy Peterson this time. And, but, you know, I don't know. The guy's extraordinarily lazy. And I guess it doesn't matter when it's a fake name. You just say yeah. whatever. But, yeah, Elliot Broidy, I don't know. He's seemed, you know, He seems like a genuinely busy guy. <laughs> he might not have had well, time he's, to do he's, this. he's grafting all over the place. But, you know, it's – and I hmm. actually wonder if he's still in the picture in terms of clients who need uh, stuff from – the Trump hmm. administration. Yeah, it might be hard to do the give me access thing when I, I assume well, somebody somewhere, some lawyer somewhere, maybe the new guy, is saying, yeah, don't take his calls for a little while. Well, I mean, look at Hugh Hewitt, who is still a pet peeve of mine. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, his law firm is making the money and he's got interest in it, but he says, he, I'm not doing it directly. It's like, but yeah, you're getting paid for it, though. You you send the the key email that gets the meeting. Yeah. And you get paid for it. Right. Well, so maybe Brody's the same thing. I've got the goods on on these guys because the reality is, what if what if if Campos is right, mm-hmm. Brody can blow everybody up. Yeah. So I'll just cash in instead and say, no, no, it was you know, totally you know, me. I'll create a quote shell corporation unquote maybe that's mm-hmm. got shares in some entity that's getting the business, and I'm getting my money that way. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, but that's the most interesting thing that happened yesterday, early afternoon. <laughs> well, yeah, that and blowing up the Iran deal, but uh, I know you must have oh, covered right. that well, already. That, uh, well, sort of, to an extent. It's just uh, everybody knew it was coming and then he did it and then the whole world was mad at him. And the Iranians might possibly just simply abide by the agreement anyway, which might be their best option, although it only makes – Donald Trump say, see, I told you the Iran deal was terrible. They're doing exactly what we wanted them to do without having to do anything for them. So I made an even greater deal. But I do believe that they'll just eventually remake the deal along the same or essentially the same lines. I think they'll get a little bit more from the other partners. Uh, I think that what happens now is the other six countries – Step up to make up the difference, perhaps. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I don't know, scrap something, but I think they'll 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 pull some concessions out of could uh, be out of the on net. It may end up being the same, but you know, but then Donald Trump will be able to or will certainly lie about it, even if he's not able to, and say, well, okay, so if the same deal is in place, but the U.S. is contributing this much less to it, but getting the same results even though it's coming at the cost of other allies, good. We should been, they should have been paying more to NATO anyway or whatever. Well, I, don't, I, I think that concessions don't necessarily mean one-sided. For example, it could be uh, agreeing that certain classes of transactions are now going to be permitted that might not have been permitted before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the thing that's remarkable is the real beef with Iran Actually, it wasn't the Iran deal itself. It was other things. The missile testing. It was the involvement in the Yemen situation, uh, obviously mm-hmm. Syria uh, and Hezbollah. Uh, those types of things were going to be subject to, the negoti- to, to further negotiation. And from what we've heard from some reporting is that the, the other allies were actually engaged in those negotiations of what to give Iran in order to get them to curb these other activities. Um, and I think that goes by the wayside. I think the Iran's going to say, screw you, I'm not going to do any of that. Hmm. But i tell you what, I'll hold the existing deal if you give me or if we change the deal in this way. Um, and that, that might not even hold for Iran. See, that's the other problem. When we say Iran, Iran's not some monolith. There are hardliners and they didn't like the Iran deal in Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rouhani, the the leader, was relatively speaking again Iran is Iran uh, of, of the moderate faction uh, in Iran, and uh, he was certainly weakened by this. And to degree, you might get uh, more activity in those other fronts from Iran uh, as a result of this. There's there's nothing good that comes from this. Um, Again, I predicted yesterday, and I was wrong, that Trump would say, we're going to leave the deal in six months if we don't get A, B, and C. So he could prove what a great deal maker he was. Mm-hmm. But that's not obviously what he did. Um, and I don't understand. It makes no sense on any level except one. And I'll offend people. I think Netanyahu drove this. No. Oh. And what Netanyahu wants is belligerence. High, heightened belligerence between the United States and Iran. Uh, and uh, the idea, I would think, is at some point that the United States works for regime change in Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no, unless, that, uh, unless uh, what's his name? Remember the guy from Iraq who was actually Iranian? Uh, With Shabali, Shabani, I can't even remember his name anymore. Oh, uh, okay. Judith Miller's good friend. Uh, oh, Chalabi. Chalabi. Yeah. Unless there's some equivalent Iranian Chalabi who's a, you know, uh, another scam artist uh, who's going to be the, mm. the, the, the face of some Iranian uh, revolutionary overthrow group or something. I don't know. I forget what his group was called in Iraq. Um, Iraqi but, National Council or. Yeah, some, it was some weird name. God, that was Congress, a long time ago. INC, hey, hey. Iraqi National oh, Congress. By the way, that does raise a question. You know, we do, we've done too much whitewashing of, of George W. Bush. Because uh, well, a lot yes. of... Okay. A lot, uh, although it's not as... I mean, are we thinking of the right person, by the way? I, I don't know that he's Iranian. Uh, Shalvi was, was Iranian. Was he was an Iranian, Iranian agent. Now, uh, he, oh, he well, was Shia. It's... it's uh, uh, he he was an Iranian agent. I, he may have been an okay. Iraqi citizen, but he yes. was very al- he was okay. aligned with Iran. Born uh, in Iraq, and but that doesn't necessarily mean well. He's Shia. That much and sure. I mean, okay, if that's the case, yeah, yes. In fact, okay, I see that listed here that he was, and that that could very well be enough. And uh, you know, those borders weren't those, those aren't hard borders. Uh, yeah, the I way mean, we a, think a lot of, of these. The, the, these regions are much more tribal than national. Uh, that was one of the interesting things about the Ba'ath Party all over the Middle East was it, it created a a nationalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was actually pan Arab. The Ba'ath Party. Uh, uh, people forget, but at one point, uh, Syria and Egypt were one country. Yes, that's true. 
uh, and, and they were ruled, you know, there were bath parties in, in, in both. United and then Iraq, of course, Arab had its own bath Republic. party. Right. Okay. Uh, true. So anyway, it's a big mess. <laughs> and uh, well, you and I won't be able to straighten it all out. It's just, you know, very counterproductive on Iran uh, right now. Uh, but to get to the point, all the lying that the Bush administration did, but it, it, strangely, they, some people made money. Bush, uh, Cheney, uh, Hal Burton, whatever, all the, there were people that made money. Uh, there was that aspect of it, but most of it was ideological. Here it's all just narcissism and graft. Yes. You know, I, I will give the Bush crooks credit for at least being, you know, having some ideology that they were serving. Uh, this is just all graft. There's no ideology. Trump was, you know, stupid wars and blah, blah, blah. And basically he's taking a step towards war. I mean, it, it, it's not I know he always said their idea was terrible, blah, blah. But, you know, did he really care? I don't think Trump cared. I, I don't think he cares now. I think, you know, Netanyahu played to his to his narcissism somehow, and he did it better than everybody else, uh, than Macron. Now, there's a guy whose standing has to drop a little bit. His his whole strategy with Trump failed uh, on every count so far. Uh, So the bull, you know, be nice and and give him a military parade and and hugs and kisses and uh, hand holding all none of that worked. For Macron, he's basically been rebuffed by Trump on every front. So uh, it's not clear uh, that uh, Macron comes out looking very good out of this. Um, well, okay. What's next? I, right with that. Is going to be interesting because okay, what, what's next? Don't Anything? know. Yeah, I, nobody knows. He's got no idea. That was also part of the news yesterday. Uh, he, he clearly uh, Trump clearly had no idea either what the original deal did or what his action taken yesterday did, or what would come next. And uh, all diplomats who were being asked about it around the world ran away and hid because they had no idea what the answer would be. Uh, They had no, obviously, no direction from the State Department, no direction from the president, no direction from anybody about what might be next. So they simply couldn't answer the question. And if you say anything and get out in front, they'll just fire you. So... Everybody ran for cover, and even the president, when asked directly, uh, what is this going to do? How is this going to make America safer? I don't know if you got a chance to see that video clip. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. How will this make America safer? Oh, we'll be this safe. will make America much safer. Thank you. That was Thank literally, you. that was easy. And it took him a while, too, to come up with the answer. Because hearing enough. the question, I'll repeat it in the form of a statement, which is, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's an F. Okay, on the specifically test. how though? Is right. America exactly. But thank you. What a moron! Yeah. Well, we are stuck <sighs> with him. I mean, for the moment. Oh God. Anyway, yeah. The, I'll do my Joe McCarter imitation and tell you that uh, I think the thing to watch today in Congress is what I mentioned to you before: Gina Haspel's confirmation mm-hmm. hearing. Yeah. We haven't talked about torture for a long time. It's re- uh, it's reported that she will make a statement where she commits to never, ever, 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 pinky swear, yeah, countenance enhanced interrogation ever again. Yes. Well, good. <laughs> it won't do anything about what happened, but uh, uh, yeah, the uh, official circles and very respectable people are debating all sorts of things. I did grab this article from Steve Vladek, who can I, writes can I just Just make Security one point about though? it. Because Donald Trump, it. the President of the United States, says yeah. the opposite. Oh, oh, we're going to beat him up, and we should rough these guys up, and I love we torture. We should kill our family. Yes, uh, right, which is a, a, a war crime above and beyond the torture. It was a 24 episode. Jack oh. Bauer. Oh, oh, well, that explains it. It was on the telly, telly. It was on the telly. There's a 24 episode where Jack Bauer threatens to kill uh, some guy's family. Yeah. I remember that episode. Well, sure. It's because it was, movie it was horrifying. Uh, a typical movie trope. It's usually with the gangsters or. Or you think it's the bad guys do. do it, though, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. Now, this is it's a new, what the new twist is the, we're good guys and we do it anyway. Right. Yeah, that's a hell of a twist. Yeah. 
well, it's called – well, if you live your life through television, that's going to happen. You know, Quite so, honestly, you know, so I'm surprised Haspel, we haven't well, been uh, governing with Haspel a very special episode her, of Blossom yet. Gina Haspel says that we'll not do that in her testimony. I mean, isn't the obvious question, but the president says we will. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Right. I can't speculate. And who can? You know, what's the real answer? The real answer is, I don't know. Could change Taking his mind again time tomorrow. Bomb. Yes. He does, what the answer is, I won't do it and he doesn't belong in the presidency. But I can't change that. All I can tell you is I don't want to authorize if it. If he asks me to do it, I'll resign. Yeah, right. Would now, be a great answer. Isn't that terrific? Right. My first, my answer to the first question, why did I do it, is I was only following orders. My answer to the second question is I won't follow them again. Yeah. I'll never follow those orders again, I promise. Okay, sure. All right, Nazi, you're, we let you off now. Go ahead. All right. We learned our lesson. I told you world wars were full of lessons. Yes, apparently ones we don't apply. Right. Uh, this time, the lesson is that if I'm only following orders, but I say I won't do it again, you let me go. Because let me tell you about what a waste of money Spandau prison is. <laughs> God, what a world. Yep, that's it. Uh, so luckily we have more of the week left <laughs> to try and lift your that's... spirits before the weekend. But if we hey, land it today. Day. We still got two to go. By God, what's going to fall on Friday? Who mm. the heck knows? Oh, I guess Trump, you know, got hostages freed like, from North Korea. Oh, just for the sake of the record, because the the media seems to not know this. Mm. There were hostages released by North Korea in 2014. There were hostages released in 2009. I'm pretty sure there were hostages released during the Bush administration, and there was hostages released during the Clinton administration. Yeah, this game is old and repetitive. Yes, but no one has ever done it before, before me. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. another interesting thing that we were waiting for for the week. Uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani announced that they were going to be freed, and then no one could figure out how does Giuliani know this? He has no job in the he administration, and he does no security clearance. So then he said, "Oh, uh, I don't know that they are going to be," and then it, and then they were. But he he rescinded that and said, "I, I didn't say that, or if I did, I was just guessing." Yeah, they, but that was like when he, uh, he he knew that the uh, the email investigation was going to be reopened. Yeah, he just keeps getting these weird tips, and uh, everyone has to write articles about how odd it is that he knows these things. It's, you know, and th there's actually an article about how the problem for Giuliani representing Trump in the in the Mueller investigation is he probably won't get clearance because he has too many foreign clients. Ah, uh, well, that won't matter. Because I don't know, there's just too many other things to not matter. <laughs> the president will wave his magic yes. wand and say, "I give him clearance," and he can, sort of, he can do that. So he may just go ahead and do that. Uh, it, it's as magical as the pardon wand. You can just do these things. Uh, and, and what's amazing is Trump believes that he can do that with anything, and it happens that the president has a certain number of things that he can do that with. And these are the things that come up because, because he's a criminal, these things came up very quickly. Ordinarily, it's very unusual for those powers to, to come into question or to come into play, but he did it right away. Uh, and <laughs> the day one, he was yeah. talking pardon. And he'll be thinking, I was right about my theory of the presidency. It's just that he operates in the most extreme areas of federal government jurisprudence and constitutional issues uh, automatically because he goes right to the criminal and then has to defend those things. Yeah. So he thinks the presidency is that magic wand. It ordinarily is not. There are huge limitations on the day-to-day -day operations of a normal president, but he's not operating in any of those areas and pays no attention to those things. He, he goes, we said, immediately to the criminal and lo and behold, I was right all along. The president can do whatever he wants. If the president does it, it's legal. Yeah. Richard Nixon. So many people will come away with that impression, I guess, yes. and uh, we'll be in big trouble. All right. Well, time for us to hand the mics over once again, having only gotten to about 11 to 15 percent of the criminality of the day. But <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to throw you off track. Hey. But, uh, 
Chris Cuomo grind, grinded my gears. Okay. Well, all right. That, that'll learn you, later. Chris. Thanks very much, Armando. I will uh, part by saying I grabbed this article by Stephen Vladek, and I think I will share it with you. It was a response to Ben Witties at Lawfare, who was actually, uh, I guess, swallowing hard and supporting Gina Haspel. And uh, Steve Vladek, uh, a, a person you should be listening to, writing at Just Security, uh, takes issue with Witties, rebuts him, and basically puts together an excellent reason why, if you were still grasping for one, and I don't see any reason why you should have been, but if you wanted one that was really good and well thought out, reason to oppose Gina Haspel, you could lean on this one, and you may have to do that during this next couple of days or during the weekend. In the meantime... We hand things over to Justice Putnam and the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy next, and we'll take a quick look and see what has he got that we missed today. From Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to The Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Well, it looks like Justice is the second two-thirds of his show is stuff we missed. Let's see. An Oregon constitutional sheriff compared the state's proposed AR-15 ban to Nazi Germany and Stalin's Russia when it's really more like Wyatt Earp's Dodge City. A familiar theme and many more such familiar themes coming up next.